Good morning. Beautiful day. The sun is shining. The bills have a bye week. <laughs> I'm really glad that you're here today. And those of you who are watching online, thanks for joining us. Uh, uh, we're in a series called Vision and Values. It's nice to see where we're going, and it's nice to see what matters to us. And so we're in the sixth message of this series, and today we're going to talk about something called spiritual sensitivity, spiritual sensitivity. And I want to begin this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to turn to it. If you have a Bible app, you're welcome to open that. If, uh, if you want a Bible, we actually have copies of Scripture uh, at the entrances where you came in, and then uh, it's also on the screen. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is, what is good. Reject every kind of evil. You probably have noticed our world seems to be both more sensitive and less sensitive at the same time. There's kind of a hypersensitivity to hearing things that we don't agree with. We just notice it. We pick up on it really fast. It's hard to ignore. No one has to yell it. We just hear it. And then there's an insensitivity to how we talk to people who think differently than we do. So there used to be maybe a little bit more civility, or we would reserve those comments when other people weren't around. Or maybe we reserve our comments for online options because we don't have to worry about actually facing a person in those virtual conversations. The point is, is that our sensitivity is going up to what we hear and down to how we speak. Now, when I talk to you today, my goal is actually not to convince you that God talks to me. My goal in our conversation today is to convince you that God talks to you. He's not giving you the silent treatment. That the wisest, most loving, and powerful being in all of the universe actually has something to say to you, and what he has to say is likely to surprise you. By the way, he won't tell you, he won't give you the assignment to correct everyone else. So you're off the hook. You don't have to fix anybody. Just look at somebody next to you and say, you don't have to fix me today. You just tell them that, all right? Just in case they were waiting to do exactly that. The Apostle Paul has to remind us not to stifle the Holy Spirit because that is our most common response. This is what we are most likely to do. It isn't as though we come at this conversation with an anti-spirit worldview, as though that there's nothing spiritual. Even people who don't believe in Christianity or in Christ as Messiah or in the church still often hold to spiritual worldviews. It isn't to assume that the spirit has become inactive as though when the last period was put in the, on the uh, last letter of the book of Revelation that the Holy Spirit just kind of went silent and stood in the wings and waited for this thing to play out. Paul actually clarifies his statement by what he means. The, the first way we quench the spirit is by not sharing what he prompts us to say. That's how we quench the Spirit. There are things he would like us to share with someone else. And when we don't do it, his Spirit gets quenched. And secondly, we quench the Spirit by discounting what we hear. So someone shares something with us, and we just discount it. We see it as less valuable. Now, when we come to an event like this, it's easy to assume that in public worship gatherings, the real thing we do is watch and listen. There are people in the front of the room, and they are responsible for various kinds of leadership. For example, the worship team was up here, and they're responsible to lead worship. And now I'm teaching scripture, so I'm responsible to teach and bring understanding to things that we see in God's word. And the challenge is, is that if you're not at the front of the room, people can assume that your only real position in spiritual community is, a, is, is an observer, possibly a student. People leading in worship are absolutely important. 
and what they do is critical, but they don't come just for a concert so that we can watch. Their goal is engagement of all of us in the worship and praise of our God. And people who are doing teaching, whether it's myself or someone else, scriptural teaching is very important, but the goal is not to provide a lecture that you endure or listen to or even can remember. The goal of scripture is to transform our lives through its application in our lives. It's crucial mistake to, to assume that the only work that the Holy Spirit does in our gatherings comes from the front of the room. There's stuff that the Holy Spirit wants to do today in every square inch of our space and beyond. And until we understand that, we'll just assume that only the people who are up front are the ones that God is using. There's a passage that Paul, the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians, also in the fifth chapter, and it says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Exercise caution, be especially wise, making the most of every opportunity, why should we do that? Because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another, speaking to one another, speaking to one another. What are we supposed to say? Things from psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone, everyone, everyone is to make the most of every opportunity. Well, when? All the time. <laughs> Whenever the opportunity arises. Why? Because evil days have a way of eroding our strength and weakening our vision and diminishing our confidence and decreasing our joy and depleting our resolve. That's what evil days do. It's not that we're just constantly shocked by things that shouldn't happen. It's that the overall atmosphere of our world seems to deplete our capacity and our resolve to be able to see something better or do something better. And the result is, is that we see things so much that we don't want to see that we don't want to see anymore. We just put our heads down and our hands go in our pockets. And, and this is the position that it's easy to assume in our world. And that is the position of spirit-quenching realities. That we have to be able to see. We have to have our hands out. We have to be able, looking for the opportunities that God provides for us. And people have a tendency to self-medicate. And in our culture, like in Paul's culture, the only real option they had was wine. In our culture, there's almost no end to the ways we can self-medicate. But the challenge is, is that whenever we deaden ourselves to something we don't like, we also numb ourselves to things that we do want. So it's easy to come into a room like today, and maybe, maybe the worship team didn't sing your, your favorite song. And you go, oh, I wasted my time. <laughs> or, or maybe you're not enjoying this message so much. Oh, I'm wasting my time. The beautiful thing about watching me online is, is you, can, you can shut me off with a button. Much harder to do in person. It just is. Uh, here's the challenge. The preaching can be good and the worship can be brilliant and you could have been in the space to enjoy all of it and you can still waste your time. Every time we quench the spirit, we misuse our time. So what does Paul say? Speak to one another. Not just listen to what the guy says in the front of the room or the gal says in the front of the room. Speak to one another. Speak to one another. What are we supposed to say? Maybe a line out of one of the poems in Scripture just came to your mind. It's something that you could share. Or a phrase of a song that we were singing today. An encouraging thought that occurs to us that's worth sharing with someone. Speak to one another those things. Two questions to regularly ask ourselves. Any day, any time, anywhere. What is the Holy Spirit saying to me? And, and sometimes it's a thought. It's an insight. Uh, I can tell you, I do believe God speaks to us. I don't hear audible voices. I don't see special lighting effects. I don't have the ground tremble under my feet. If that happens for you, 
God bless you. That would weird me out just a little bit. But I think that God does have something to say. It can be a thought. It can be an insight. It can be a prompting to act on behalf of someone else. Sometimes it's an insight that God uses from another person to share with you. And our temptation is just to ignore those things. What does the Holy Spirit desire to say through me? Not just to me, but what could I share with someone else? Paul's admonition, when we go about this, if we're going to take this seriously, if we're going to make the best use of our time and every opportunity, then he says all of these kinds of promptings and insights and intuitions need to be tested. Every one of them. Test them all. That's what he says. Test every statement. Now, before I talk to you about what those tests are, what I want to acknowledge is that there's some unhealthy ways people declare some Thing that God, they perceive that God said to them. Have you ever heard anybody uh, start a sentence like this? God told me, and sometimes they follow it with, to tell you, <laughs> and then there's something you're supposed to do, usually that they don't want to do. It's real easy to play the God told me card and not only to get other people to do things, but sometimes to avoid feedback or counsel. I, I had a person come into my office one time and they said, God told me to quit my job. What am I supposed to say then? Maybe God was having a bad day. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that you have to work in the same place for the rest of your life, but have you done any research to find out what other jobs might be available at what kind of income and would that be sufficient? But once you say, God told me, like, what am I going to say? Well, I disagree with God. I think you should listen to me. I, you, it's not an option for a pastor. I don't get to say that. And the challenge with the God told me card is that it's often used as a way to manipulate other people or it's used as a way to shut down feedback. And what you need to know is that the work of the Holy Spirit is not about manipulation or avoiding accountability and feedback. That when we are in that place, we are also quenching the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not in that business. So how do we test these thoughts that come to our minds? How can we discern what the Spirit might be saying? And here's what we notice. We're actually given three tests. It's in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. There's, there's three chapters in 1 Corinthians, 12, 13, and 14, that's all about the workings of the Spirit in our lives and in our world. It's fascinating reading, and Paul goes into great depth, mostly because that church was really messing it up and they needed some instruction. But it's really helpful for us. And, and so he talks about, this is what he says, one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening encouraging and comfort. One who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, their encouraging, and their comfort. Now, sometimes we confuse a concept in the Bible about spirit-inspired comments or thoughts with Oh, an office of a prophet in the, in the ancient world and in the Old Testament, and by the way, in some places in the New Testament, there were people that God called to be prophets. And, and prophets would do a couple of things really well. And the first thing that they would do is they had a capacity to see what the trajectory of, of people's actions, behaviors, and attitudes, where it would lead them. They could pick up on that. Like other people might just be going along, but they could plot it out. It's like a, a form of spiritual math. If you keep on this journey, this is where it's going to wind up, and you're not going to like it when you get there. And so they would kind of warn people about that. So they would speak into their lives for that purpose. These individuals would, would also sometimes predict future events. The purpose of predicting the future event was not to avoid a challenge, but to prepare people for it so that they would lean into their responsibility and bear the options that God was providing for them so that a bunch of people, not just themselves, would benefit from that. 
So this is kind of the office of prophet. It exists in both Old Testament and New Testament, but it's not what we're talking about in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, when it says, he who prophesies. That is about something you believe the Holy Spirit has whispered to your heart, and now you want to share with someone else. So here's the test. This is how you can tell whether that thought, that, that prompting, that insight, that idea uh, is, is, is appropriate or inappropriate. And the first thing he says is, does it strengthen does it strengthen the person that you're talking to? Do your words build people up or tear them down? God has not authorized you to tear anybody down. And anybody who claims that they're speaking for God when they're tearing people down is not speaking for God. Paul identified the test. Does it build people up? Now, some will claim an exemption here because they're speaking the truth. I'm just, it, I, it may hurt, but I'm just telling you the truth. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, you speak the truth in love. Speaking the truth out of love is as much of a deception as lying outright. Well, I don't know how to say it in love. Then you get to be quiet. <laughs> it's not in the Bible, but we've all done it, isn't it? We bite our tongue. Anybody done that besides me? Anybody doing it right now? <laughs> yeah. So speak the truth in love. Truth, when it's used God's way, actually brings freedom to people's life, and it builds people up. There's always a better way to say it. Uh, for example, there might be a person who's struggling with an addiction, and, and you don't want them to have that struggle anymore, and you might have a thought about the broken heart of God. And so you go to that person, and you could say this, I just... I just think you're breaking God's heart. Don't you just feel encouraged, built up? There's a better way to say that. I don't think God's heart is broken by you. I think his heart is broken for you. When he sees what you're having to go through, it breaks his heart. What an incredible difference that word makes. Which, by the way, when Jesus was gathered with his closest followers on the Last Supper, this is what he said. This is my body which is broken for you. Very different way to approach. God wants a fulfilling life for you. He's got a path that he wants you to be on that will lead you to all of the hopes and dreams he has for you. And the question is, what could you trust him with today that could change all of that? What's the beginning steps of those journey? Uh, I can give you a little example. This last week, I decided to text a friend of mine. He came to my mind along with a thought that I was thinking about him. I was, I was uh, sitting and, and looking out the window, and I was thinking about him because I, uh, I I'd actually just spent some time with him recently, and a thought came right behind it. And for those of you who are familiar with a particular Old Testament book uh, called Esther, you'll know this phrase. The, the phrase was, uh, you were uh, called for such a time as this. And it has to do, in the, in the Old Testament, Esther was put in a position as queen, and yet she was very anxious about giving attention to something or calling attention to the king specifically. And, and her uncle says, maybe this is the reason God put you in that position. And so I just, I just texted that out. And what I didn't know is right at that moment, he was in a very demanding assignment. And, and it was difficult for him to get through. And he texted back that those words were so helpful for him in that moment. Now, I didn't say, God told me to tell you. Just, just you don't have to put that in there. Just say, I think, I think maybe you are where you are right now because that's where God wants you to be. It's a very powerful thing to say. By the way, I don't have to think of something to say. I don't have to make something up. Oh, what should I say? What should I say? What should I say? Uh, say don't say anything stupid. <laughs> you know, it's just, the goal is to listen. And then just share if God gives you something to say. And here's the secret strategy about that. The more often you, you pray for people, the more likely you are to hear something from heaven to share with them. If you don't ever pray for people, you might not hear very much. 
Uh, the Greek word here for strengthening is actually the word building. And this is what I know, having come through our construction project here, is that uh, we don't just take hammer and nails and wood and drag it out into a field and start making it up as we go along. There's a design. There's a plan. And what you need to know is God has a design and a plan for every person's life. And he wants to give us words to speak that help move them along, to build them up into the building that God is creating them to be. Second test, do these words encourage? What does that mean? To actually pour courage in. Have you ever had someone, when they started talking to you, your confidence began to wane? You thought you could do something, and after a conversation with them, you weren't so sure? God wants us to have the opposite effect of that, to pour courage. The Greek word actually means to draw near and give evidence. It's a really interesting word. So this is how we can do this. You can observe things about people's life and you come close to them and affirm what you observed. So um, let's, say, let's say you're in the lobby today and let's say that there is a mom with a toddler who's having a toddler meltdown. And a lot of people treat that like a radioactive environment. They just back up and they give glances that communicate, you need to get that kid under control pretty quick. And uh, it's not easy. If you've ever had a kid go crazy on you like that, that that's a hard thing. My, my wife works as a pharmacist in a supermarket, and sometimes she can hear a child crying up and down the aisles, <laughs> the whole time. And I have so much respect for a mom who can actually think what to shop when you're doing that, because like, I would just throw a bunch of stuff in the buggy and get out of town like as fast as I could. And, and, and so what, what we're observing, it would be really easy to go, oh, why, don't, why don't they get those kids under control? Yeah, we'll give you a toddler and see how you do. Just, that's not going to go so well. Okay, so we could come alongside that person and say, I know, kids will stretch you to your limit. And I saw how much patience you had. It's a good thing. How fortunate your child is to have a mom who has that kind of patience, or a dad who has that kind of patience, because there are so many who don't today. Do you see what happens? You have evidence. You came alongside. You drew near, and you shared something that you observed. It makes the difference. Uh, third test, do words comfort? Do your words comfort? We, we all experience disappointment and loss. I, I'm not able to to find a path through life that exempts you from grief. Uh, there are lots of things that do not go as planned. Delays are common to any human experience. So does God have anything to say to people who are experiencing grief? And the answer is yes. This Greek word actually means to calm or console. And here's the thing. Calming and consoling isn't that you're able to change what's going on in their life. It's a resource that's available to people who can't get out of what's going on in their life. If you've lost someone really dear to you, it's not possible for you just to shut that emotion off and not miss them anymore or care that they're gone. And by the way, that's not what God intends to do for you. The Greek word is to calm and to console. So even if God can't change the situation right now, Maybe there's something that we could communicate that would help that person. I can affirm, I can, I can acknowledge, I know this is hard, I know this is challenging, I know this is painful. Do you know how helpful it is for people to hear that you do see this is a hard thing that they are going through? And to affirm to them, I believe you are going to make it through this painful season. And I do believe that there are resources available from God for you right now. Maybe strength just to get through one more day. Maybe wisdom to know what thing that needs to be done. Maybe a kind of discernment to know I don't need to do that today. That's too much. 
It's really important. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. You can't control all the words you will hear. And there is an effort in our culture trying to do just that. And that's not just one-sided. That's everybody. So Paul doesn't say, shut the mouths of those who say things who aren't encouraging or edifying or, or comforting. This is what he says. Test everything. Hold on to what is good. Hold on to what is healthy. Hold on to what is truthful. Hold on to what is helpful. We all do this, right? We ruminate. We, we go over and over in our mind about something that we heard, something that we read, something that we saw. And Paul gives us incredible information. We get to choose what we dwell on. Think about that. Oh, don't get me wrong. Some things are easier to focus on. But you can actually direct your attention to something else. Do not discount or discredit what God wants to speak to you. Paul says that when we do that, it's a form of contempt. Something or someone comes to us, and we might think, well, God wouldn't use them. Why not? Why not? What if what they say is incredibly valuable to your life? And the question is, what kind of church would we become if our reputation was that we followed the promptings of God's Holy Spirit to encourage and strengthen and comfort other people when they showed up in this place. Not just from a talk from the front of the room, but every square foot that they were in this place. And what if we had a reputation that one of the things that's true about people who are connected with Calvary was everywhere they go, they seem to be able to speak words into people's lives that build them up and pour courage in and comfort them in challenging seasons of their life. It's a very powerful thing. So before we leave today, I want us to try an experiment. Now you might be here and you go, oh, pastor, uh, I'm not even sure I believe in God. And uh, uh, so I don't think he would speak to me. I'm going to surprise you. God doesn't require you to be a fully devoted follower of him for him to speak to you. So this is what we're going to do. I want you to, to find something to write with and write on. You can use your phones, smart devices, uh, grab an envelope out of the chair in front of you. If you're home, just grab a scrap of paper, anything, pen, pencil, crayon, doesn't matter. It's just grab something. Everybody grab something you can take a note on right now. And what I want us to do, as soon as you have something, we're going to bow our heads, and all we're going to do is we're going to ask God to bring to our minds someone who could use a word that might build them up or strengthen them or comfort them and see who comes to your mind, all right? So everybody has something. Just bow your head, and right now just think. Just, just ask God, who, who could I say something to today that would be helpful for them? Now, whoever that face was or name was that came to your mind, I want you to jot that down on your piece of paper or put that note in your phone right now. Like, take it seriously. Take it seriously. And, and you might be here this morning and going, I don't even believe in God, but someone just came to your mind and you should take it seriously. Because what if the God you don't believe in has something to say to you? Like, that would be worth knowing. Right? Now, here's what I want you to do. Once again, just bow your head and, and ask God, what is something I could share with them that would build them up, that would pour courage in or comfort them? And just, just take a half a minute right now, ask God that question. Now, whatever that thought was that came to your mind, I want you to jot it down. And you can do it in, in short form. You don't have to write the whole thing out. We don't have time for an essay, but just a thought. And now I'd like everyone to look at me, if you would. 
Take that seriously. What if God just whispered something to you and that could be life to someone else? And, and I know this is what we think. Uh, Pastor, I think that was just me. Okay. If you had a thought all by yourself and it's strengthening and it's encouraging and it's comforting, share it anyway. Amen? Heavenly Father, our ears are open to what you have to say. We want to say the kinds of things that build people up, that pour courage in, and help them bear the challenges that they're going through. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet.